Welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 174, featuring the third part of my interview with the Quest for Glory designers, Lori and Corey Cole. In this part of the interview, we talk about the uh, Quest for Glory 2, 3, and 4 games. And I think you'll really be uh, touched by Lori's uh, account of the fiasco surrounding the fourth and to many minds, a best entry in the whole franchise. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Lori and Corey Cole. Well, when the game came out, it was obviously you know, it was a big hit, and you must have felt really good, so it was uh, time for the sequel, uh, Trial by Fire. And this, you know, it's quite a different than the, than the first game, right? So I was wondering what was the rationale behind the 30-day time limit? And Well, a, a lot of stuff happened there. Uh... For one thing, we did not expect that we would be going into a sequel immediately after the first game. Uh, Sierra assumed that we would do one game and then we would move on to something else, maybe another uh, uh, project. You know, even though they had the series, they normally put their series games two or three years apart. They didn't try to do one every year. Uh, and Heroes Quest caught the company by total surprise. Uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, for, for their first 30 days sales, I think it was their best-selling game in history, uh, uh, for a game that they did not expect uh, to do all that well. You know, Ken Williams had no clue what was going on with this thing. He said, this game's weird. You know, it's got all this uh, combat stuff, this role-playing stuff. Uh, you know, is this really a Sierra game? I don't know if anyone will like this. Uh, and people really responded. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that, you know, long-term that we did as well as said King's Quest. Obviously, that was Sierra's bestseller. Uh, but... The game was much more uh, successful out the door than Sierra expected. And so they turned around and said, hey, we want you to do a sequel. And we said, no problem. We planned this from the beginning as a four-game series, turned into five, but we planned it as a four-game series. We've got the, you know, the basic storyline all set up for the next game already. And then the world changed. Yeah, we thought <laughs> we knew what we were doing coming out of the first game. You know, we were, we were clueless coming into the thing. We'd never actually done a computer game when we came to Sierra, but we thought we could do it. Okay, now we've done it. We've learned all these lessons of what we can do and what we can't do. Now we're starting out. We know what we're doing, except that we didn't, because the whole way of doing games changed between game one and game two, because Sierra was ramping up to do the 256 color. Yeah, we were moving from EGA to VGA, and in order to do the VGA, the old way of doing Sierra games at the point when uh, we first started working there is that uh, the artists actually um, drew an outline of uh, each of the objects on the screen. It was very much like paint by numbers. Uh, they would then do a fill command to fill it with a uh, color or a pattern, uh, and they actually, all those pictures in the early Sierra games were done with that combination of... Uh, uh, vector drawing and uh, uh, fills because that used very little memory. And when they were on the original uh, uh, PC floppy disk, 360K on a floppy disk, uh, they needed extreme compression. There was no way they could put bitmaps on there. Uh, when they went to 256 colors, they said, uh, you know, there's no way that the artists are going to be able to do vector drawings and fills and so on in 256 colors. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they just won't look good. And so they needed a new set of tools, and they said the way to do this is uh, to use traditional art techniques, to do pencil drawings, uh, uh, to uh, paint, and then we will use cameras and scan these into the game. Uh, and they needed that in order to do 256 games. So we were the transition period. Quest for Glory 2, uh, you know, the company debated, uh, you know, the first game was really successful. Uh, we don't have any games coming out this year at all because it's taking a while to ramp into this 256 color stuff. Uh, uh, which one game do we want to have come out this year and be an old style 256, uh, I mean 16 color parser game? And which ones are we going to move forward in 256? And we were chosen as the one that was going to be the last Sierra parser game. Uh, but we had to prototype, we had to practice all the techniques they were using for the 256 games so that they could debug the process. And so we got the first, both, worst of both worlds. We had a new system that had never been tried before and all the bugs of that. And we were doing it under the old school so that the colors weren't as good or that. And, and under a new administration and a different way of treating people. I mean, we got time clocks. We, were, we had to 
punch in our, our number to get into the Sierra so that we would work the set number of hours. And it was like all of a sudden we had gone from this free form company that, you know, we, we got to work. We got this. We had a wonderful time with Quest for Glory One, relatively speaking. It was a great experience. And suddenly we came to the authoritarian, this is when the hours you have to work. And if, if, uh, Artists have to work now, programmers have to be there, and programmers will work over here, and artists will work over there, and only the bosses can talk to one another. You can't talk to the artist that's doing the art for your room. Well, it was very democratic. They, uh, they polled all the employees, and they said, what, you know, what do you want your core working hours to be? And all the programmers said, nine to six. And all the artists said seven to four. Uh, the artists wanted to get home while there was still enough light that they could uh, go up to their studios and paint and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, they said, well, you've all got to work together. And all the artists said, we want to get there early in the morning. All the programmers said, we want to work late in the afternoon. Uh, and eventually they made everybody coming in at eight and nobody was happy. <laughs> and what was the reason for all of these uh, changes? They were trying to actually control the chaos. I mean... It was really very free form. When I went to work for Sierra, they basically said, okay, uh, you're the designer of this project, so you're in charge, and you have to, you know, do schedules and get this project out. It's like, like, wait a second. I'm in charge of a, you know, team of programmers and, and artists, and I'm, you know, it's like, like, what administrative skills do I have? I've never done anything like it. Well, they wanted to put people actually in charge of things and try to get schedules moving. So they were trying to create a real company instead of this, okay, this is your group, you guys do what you want and get the game out. Yeah, if you wanted to do a job description of a game designer at the point we started with Sierra, it was a very nearly impossible set of skills. Uh, you had to be a writer, uh, you had to be a, a project manager and team leader, uh, you had to uh, be skilled with uh, uh, doing budgets. So the things that are in a, a producer's job now were incorporated into the designer job. Uh, you have to know gaming. You have to uh, know artwork because you have to be able to direct the art team uh, and be able to communicate with them. And it just so happened that, well, Lori was a school teacher, and that's how she learned how to, uh, uh, to manage teams and control a group. Uh, and she had taken art classes, that's how she knew, and animation classes, that's how she knew how to talk to the artists. So miraculously, uh, and of course they also expect you to be a programmer, which Lori wasn't, but she was married to one, and so I was able to help her through the programming aspects. Uh, so miraculously, we just happened to have every one of those requirements. But there are not very many people in the world uh, that could have done everything that was expected of a, uh, a Sierra game designer uh, before they broke down. I mean, nowadays you have teams of uh, 100, 200 people, and everybody is in an uh, extremely narrow uh, specialty. They have uh, riggers and animators, and and that's what Sierra was trying to do. Bill Davis came in as the new uh, creative director. He was from a uh, Hollywood advertising studio background, and he said, uh, you know, great artists are expensive. What you want to do is leverage uh, the, the, you know, studios don't, waste, uh, you know, their artists drawing every single uh, uh, frame of an animation. They draw keyframes, and then you get, uh, you know, low-level intern artists to be uh, the uh, tweeners and to, uh, you know, draw the in-between frames. Uh, and so he was setting up a process like that with a very formal, uh, the game had to be completely designed up front and storyboarded out. Uh, Lori collaborated with uh, uh, Ken Nishue, the uh, lead artist. And by the way, I think uh, Ken did an absolutely fantastic job of, uh, you know, bringing life to those 16 color games and making them look like uh, more than 16 colors. Uh, but, uh, but a, uh, you know, like a month or two months up front of just creating these storyboards. And you have to understand the typical Sierra schedule for a game at that point was less than a year to do an entire game. Uh, so that was a big chunk of our development time went into uh, uh, the upfront design, the storyboards. And after that, we knew exactly what we needed. And on the surface, that sounds like something that everybody should think is the best way to do a game. Because, you know, if you know exactly where you're going, you've got everything planned out, then everybody can do their jobs, and it's all smooth. Uh, the problem is that great games uh, come from the energy of the team. 
uh, that are collaborative uh, exercise, and everybody's uh, making suggestions along the way. Uh, we had uh, scenes in the original Heroes Quest uh, that, that came about because one of the artists was doodling, and a programmer looking over his shoulder saw the artist's screen and said, what are you drawing there? And the artist said, uh, oh, that's a dinosaur. And I said, you know, well, there aren't any dinosaurs in that game. Well, I guess we should put dinosaurs in this game. Uh, you know, I you know, I don't know about the specific example, but uh, uh, and then uh, they would start uh, programming up a dinosaur dinosaur thing, and then they'd uh, turn around to uh, Laurie or me and say, uh, "Hey, we got this cool thing I put together with this artist, and uh, what do you think of this?" And we'd say, "Well, it's it's cute. It doesn't have anything to do with the game, but well, let's see. Is there some way we can make that make sense in the game?" And, you know, that's where you come up with a lot of the stuff. Uh, uh, the reason that Heroes Quest is all about puns, I mean, I've always loved puns. I'm a, I'm a punny guy. Uh, uh, some say I'm a, uh, you know, incorrigible punster, don't, so don't encourage me. Uh, but that isn't why we had puns in uh, Heroes Quest. We had puns because Bob Fishbach, one of the programmers, uh, was writing filler uh, text. So if you uh, said, look at the tree, uh, uh, you know, he was putting in placeholder text. And he put in some, you know, some jokes in there and some puns, uh, and we said, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of fun. So, uh, I actually wasn't on uh, Heroes Quest uh, for the first month. I was still finishing up uh, uh, some other uh, systems programming projects for the company. Uh, so they pulled me on as a programmer, and I was using Bob's stuff as an example. So I kind of went in the same vein he did, and that became the style of the game. If we had planned the whole thing up front, it probably would have been a really serious game without any of that level of humor that the series became noted for. Yeah, so it was really a collaborative effort, but now Sierra had changed, and now we were regimented, we were organized, and boy, there's a reason why there's a Shapir in the game, and there's a Rasir in the game, and Rasir is the anagram of Sierra, and it was incorporating all of the uh, 1984 what would a society be with a totalitarian dictator whose name happens to be an anagram of Bill Davis and, and the things like that? <laughs> there were just simply, the world had changed entirely and how to do a game had changed entirely and the atmosphere at the Sierra had changed entirely. So, so we had kind of fun parodying it. You know, obviously it's all an exaggeration. There's a long tradition of that. There's a, one of the space quests where they had... Uh, uh, Ken Williams and uh, Rick Cavan in the uh, game uh, 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 whipping the uh, programmers in their uh, maze of cubicles. Uh, and, you know, that no doubt came out of some frustration that uh, Mark and Scott had at the time with management. And uh, so they made fun of it in the game. So uh, they got away with that. We figured we could get away with this. And uh, amazingly, we, you know, to a large extent we did. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we were having fun with it at the same time, but it was also a, a very stressful uh, period. And, it's, you know, it's hard to make a game funny when you're under stress. Well, things gotten better when, uh, by uh, Quest for Glory 3. Every game, I said, is, you, you, learn, different. Yes, you learn the <laughs> lessons. You got, you've got all these lessons you learned from the previous game, and all the world changes again. There was never a period of time that was as stressful as the time for Trial by Fire. We certainly named that game well, because it was <laughs> our Trial by Fire. Uh, but every other game period, there were frustrations with it, and, and different rules we were playing under, but nothing was as bad as that period of time. Yeah, we had uh, little problems like with Heroes Quest, uh, where they had checked and saw that nobody had uh, uh, trademarked the name, but Sierra didn't actually register the trademark uh, when they did that. And so they then discovered that a British company had a board game called Advanced Hero Quest, and they were wanting to do a video game. And they said, well, you can go ahead and make your game, but you can't sell it anywhere in Europe because your European distribution is out of England. And we have the UK uh, rights to this name, Hero Quest, and Rose Quest is too close. Uh, so, you know, just after launching this best selling game, uh, we had to change the name to Quest for Glory, and Sierra didn't even have the right to advertise formerly Hero's Quest. Uh, so we felt like, okay, yay, we built up an audience, and now we're going to come up with a game that nobody will even know is the same game. Uh, and Quest for Glory 3, it all happened over again because our uh, it was called Quest for Glory 3 Wages of War, and right about the time they were shipping, uh, the company discovered that not having registered that trademark, that somebody else had, 
and they were doing a uh, uh, a uh, war game shoot 'em up uh, first person shooter type game called Wages of War, and they said, "Oh, you can't use that subtitle." And so Sierra kind of got around that. Uh, in theory, we changed the name to Seekers of the Lost City, but I'm not sure that any copy of the game actually ever went out the door with that title. Uh, Sarah basically did a, uh, you know, let's uh, delay the process as long as possible, and by then we'll have sold most of the copies we were going to sell anyway. <laughs> and the truth was, the other game never actually shipped anyway, so it didn't matter, but we had frustrations with every game and new rules and new ways to do the game each time. So Quest for Glory 3 was our first one that was the full point-and-click uh, 256 color uh, game. Uh, we had painted backgrounds. Uh, was Andy Hoyos in that one? Yeah, Andy Yeah, Hoyos. so we had an incredible uh, art team uh, doing just gorgeous art. I mean, we look at that game now and say, that's only 256 colors. That game looks incredible. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, it holds up, I think, uh, th uh, through the uh, years. Uh, and... You know, it's just, uh, we had an absolute gorgeous game, but, you know, we had to learn design all over again. Uh, and we had to say, okay, how can we make uh, these conversations interesting? Uh, the, the processes were different. I think we were doing a simultaneous Macintosh support, so we had to do some uh, things for that. There was a lot of stuff going on. Each and every game was different. Yeah, and I read some previous interviews. There was, uh, it was originally going to be a darker game, is my understanding. Not three so much, but three. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Three was not part of the sequence yes. initially. Uh, uh, it's it's not like the uh, Lee Shoot Larry's uh, uh, missing case of missing floppy disk where the game never actually existed. Uh, but in the case of Quest for Glory three, uh, Quest for Glory three was going to be Shadows of Darkness. Yes, which we became actually the fourth game. we actually foreshadowed it at the end of two that we were, you know. In two, you destroy the villain, and then in th in, in three, you were going to the shadows of darkness. Well, uh, and, and it was going to be this dark horror game with all these, you know, Lovecraftian undertones and that. It was going to be really cool, and it was the game I was looking forward to doing. But in between the second game and the third in the series, we were doing educational games. There was this big long break, and you know, we were having trouble with the names and things like that. So it was like, oh, my God, there's, there's a two-year break between this game and the next game. And they're going into the new players. You're going to go into this dark horror movie. They're not going to have a clue what we're doing. Yeah, we were thinking we were going to get players who had never played any of the previous games, which was kind of a, a change when we originally proposed the series. We just assumed that people would play through the series in order. Uh, that you would go from game one to game five, and we would tell a story that developed through the course of all the games. Uh, but uh, when we went off and did uh, Castle of Dr. Brain and mixed up fairy tales, uh, in between Quest for Glory 2 and 3, we suddenly realized that, no, two years have passed, we're going to get players who have never seen a Quest for Glory coming in here, uh, and we can't really make that incredibly difficult, challenging, horror-filled game we were going to do. Players will be overwhelmed. And so we wanted an in-between game, and that's why we came up with Wages of War, which was, you know, it wasn't in the original plans, but it really fit in well. It was this, uh, it, it took some of the characters from game two and pulled you into this African adventure, because each game was set in a different genre, different type of mythology, different background, and so it's like, giving the player a whole different experience each time you played the game. So this was a, going to Africa, going to Fricana, and dealing with it there would be a much lighter beginning and would be more um, more like a, a traditional adventure game. And so that's where we went to try to keep, to keep the player from being overwhelmed and to build our audience back up for the real shadows of darkness, so that we could really hit them hard this, with that one. It was also that we were uh, really looking forward to that environment because uh, you know there were no games out there set in Africa, uh, you know, and very few uh, games that had uh, black characters at all, and the ones that did mostly had them as uh, you know criminals. Uh, and that we wanted to make a game that really expressed that rich culture. Uh, and, uh, you know, something different than had ever been done before. So we were actually, you know, we became very excited about it, even though it wasn't in the original plans. 
Yeah, we were throwing our hero from the, the you know, came from Germanic cultures and, and things like that. We're throwing him, and he is the only sole white guy in this culture of, of strange animals, strange creatures, and strange cultures. You have to learn how to deal with a culture that isn't your own, and there's several different cultures you have to learn to deal with. So it was immersion of what do you do when you're in a strange, strange land, and you don't even know what the rules are so oh and speaking of the rules changing um uh sierra at this point uh had pulled me off the series and said you know we need this uh, sega genesis cd uh uh interpreter and you're the only one in the company could do it uh and so Lori was sitting there uh have, you know with a game that she discussed with me of course in the evenings uh but she was doing all the design and all the writing herself uh so i was off on this other project and uh you know, Sarah probably didn't even want me in the room, but of course, you know, I came in once in a while to help out with things. Uh, so that's, you know, one of the reasons you get a little bit uh, different flavor is that the, the games that I had the highest involvement in uh, as a designer were probably two and four. Uh, and uh, one I had a lot to do with, but I wasn't in on the early phase of the project. I wasn't in until about a month into the game. So the tone was set by, uh, you know, other team members and so on. And then uh, five. Uh, oh, oh you actually, weren't even on the company. Yeah, I was. I wasn't even in the in this the city, the city uh, for yeah, five. Yeah. I was. Uh, I was off working for Accolade uh, during another uh, project because we had come into Sierra. They had said, you know what? We've had a uh, mass mailing campaign from fans because the game the series ended well, after game four. Yes, at four. Yes. I think that, that that's getting. Are we are, are we jumping around yeah. too much? Yeah, yeah. I definitely wanted to talk about Shadows of Darkness because, uh, Lord, this is your favorite of the series, right? Oh, I think it's the favorite of most fans too, because it really is one of the more interesting of the of the series. It's got beautiful artwork. It it just comes together really well, except for a major major problem with it. Well, the, the major problem was that it was uh, by far the buggiest game we ever showed. It was the most complex. Uh, yeah, it was a, a you know we had added a lot of new stuff in. We had uh, you know a lot of events that were conditional and other events and that needed massive amounts of testing. Because uh, Lori has the amazing ability to hold an entire game and everything that's going on in the game in her head at the same time. I look at pieces of it at a time. Like I can't keep all that in mind at once. But it's very easy to slip up in programming and uh, have something in one scene of the game that. You've just forgotten to specify that this only happens if a certain flag is set. Uh, so when Lori uh, just recently went through some of the uh, online playthroughs of uh, Quest for Glory 4, and was kind of hitting her head, and uh, there was uh, the Paladin uh, using a levitation spell to float over the gate uh, because of a programming bug. Uh, we had crashes, we had all kinds of stuff. And what had happened is that uh, up until then, uh, both Quest for Glory 1 and 2 were completed in less than a year. Uh, I think it was about nine months for the first game, uh, 10 or 11 months for the second game, uh, barely, barely making Christmas for Quest for Glory 2. Uh, and Quest for Glory 3, we were in the same kind of schedule, but it was, uh, you know, it was a bigger, more complicated game. And by 4, we had so much complexity in there. The design, the amount of dialogue was, uh, you know, probably... Uh, five times as much as had been in the first game. It was a novel, effectively. And then we had, we were going over, uh, Sierra was doing a new engine. They'd always had oh, this right. gaming yeah. engine that we based all the games off of. Well, they were starting a new engine to be more sophisticated to handle these things. The problem with it was when we started the game, it wasn't done. Right. And in fact, it wasn't done for like five months of the beginning of the game and they still wanted to ship at yeah. that to make Christmas Yeah, they that wanted year. to make Christmas. It was like, you know, uh, you got to hit Christmas or you lose all your sales. And, uh, uh, well, we're three months from uh, uh, from Christmas and the, uh, and the interpreter still wasn't done. Uh, it, was, it was mostly working, uh, but there were some major bugs in it still. And so the programmers, nobody could test the game. Uh, and... Uh, the end result was that uh, uh, we got up to uh, late November, and basically it had to go out the door within a few weeks or uh, there would be no Christmas sales at all. And the programmers at this point had all been putting in 60-hour uh, weeks, 
Uh, they for were exhausted. Months and months. You well, know, for about three months, yeah. They were exhausted. Uh, everybody on the team was worn out, uh, and they said, "You know, just ship it. Just get it out of here." And we were like, "No, it's not ready. It hasn't had enough testing time." Because it had a, a week of full testing. That was it. And then, but you know, they shipped it out. And then we found just how <laughs> how bad it really was. It was unplayable. Yeah, they had actually. Uh, I think that was the one that they had wanted to ship. Uh, and I insisted on taking a uh, vacation. I had a long. No, that trip. was, was the, that, that five? was five. Corey. Oh, okay, sorry, mixing my uh, mixing my games here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, so on four, they basically it uh, it just it just needed a whole lot more testing and uh, debugging time. It probably needed at least three months of work of the full team. That was uh, the first one to have uh, voice actors too, I believe. Uh, not, at that, not at that time. At that time, when uh, Quest for Glory 4 shipped, it was, uh, uh, you know, the same type of game as Quest for Glory 3. It was a 256 color VJ game, had music and sound, but had no voices. Uh, and three million bugs. Uh, but <laughs> the company knew this. The company knew that they had shipped a faulty product. Uh, and they took one programmer, the most junior intern on the team, uh, and they assigned him to, uh, uh, to fix the bugs in the game. And they were planning on releasing a patch. A few months later, well, uh, six months into it, he was still fixing bugs because uh, there were that many. I mean, there was probably a stack, uh, you know, uh, halfway to the ceiling of uh, bug reports. Uh, and he was still working on it. And at that point, the company said, you know, we can't do a patch in this. This is too big a change. And it's been too long. Uh, so they said, how about if we uh, uh, find some more budget for it and we do a re-release uh, with voice acting? And we said, yeah, sounds good to us. Uh, and uh, that was just just the most amazing opportunity ever. We worked with uh, 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 Stu Rosen, a very experienced uh, Hollywood director and actor. Uh, and we had audition uh, tapes that were sent to us of these people. And it was just, we just had, because voices were not big in games at the time. There were not very many games that had voice acting. And so uh, the actors had not yet learned to... Uh, uh, raise their uh, rates through the roof. So it was actually very inexpensive relatively. Uh, and we just had the most amazing crew of uh, uh, famous uh, voice actors. And getting John Reese davis uh, John Reese davies as the uh, narrator, that was just a tour de force. Uh, uh, he, he was just an amazing to work with. Uh, and I got to spend uh, several weeks uh, down in uh, North Hollywood at uh, Barbara Streisand's uh, studio uh, working with Stu and recording all these guys, and uh, it's just—it's one of those experiences that you know stays with you for a lifetime. Yeah, it's, we always said that working for Sierra was this big roller coaster. There were these incredible highs, and there were incredible lows. But you know, getting to have after this terrible, terrible experience of knowing our game was a piece of crap—you couldn't play it. That was that was just heartrending because this was. The game I knew was going to be the greatest game of the whole series, and it comes out and it's unplayable. That was just devastating. Yeah. I mean, that was a that was about the lowest as you could get from Sierra. Yeah, Laurie and Porter, heart and soul into the writing and the characters. Uh, you know, I was for the first time uh, uh, I was actually working full time in design. I did not I did not program the game. Uh, so you know, Quest for Glory two, I was the lead programmer as well as co designer. And, you know, that took most of my time uh, getting the programming right. So 4 was the first time that I really got to uh, shine as a designer. Well, Castle of Dr. Brain, of course, was my first uh, solo design experience. Uh, but uh, Quest for Glory 4, I was in there, and I was, you know, creating puzzles and mysteries. And, you know, we were, just, we were in love with what we had done with this game, and the game that shipped didn't reflect that. Uh, so having a chance to... Uh, uh, you know, play Groundhog Day and uh, read and fix all our mistakes. That was pretty amazing. Yeah, so we were really thrilled. The the voice acting was great. It was different in places. We didn't, you know, we had such talents there that not all the script lines that I wrote were the ones they read or that they created for the game. But there was a synergy because they were, at, you know, they were enjoying what they were doing and voice actors were incredible. They really are, you know, as 
good as any physical actor there is because they have to do it all with their inflection with what they do and they're just incredible. I mean, I learned a lot about writing from watching the way the uh, uh, the, the director worked with the voice actors, the way the voice actors work because uh, they would do things like if you want a sterner tone of voice, you would physically clench your fist as you talk and that would that would send signals up to your brain that would actually cause you to alter your voice. You know, if you wanted to be open and free, then you would kind of make a gesture like this, and that would actually alter the way your voice sounds. Uh, so, you know, there's just so much to learn about writing uh, from working with these people. But, uh, yeah, I take full responsibility for Hans, Franz, and Yvonne. Uh, the uh, three actors were having fun with it. Uh, we said, well, you know, what, uh, what voices can you impersonate? And two of them said, oh, I do a Jack Nicholson. And I said, you know, they sound enough apart. They could be brothers or something. And, and then they started ad-libbing all their lines. And I said, okay, this is funny. Let's leave this in. And Lori didn't find out about it until later. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a fourth installment of this interview. A lot of great stuff coming up, including uh, Quest for Glory 5 and uh, what they got up to after uh, the Quest for Glory series. Now, if you haven't heard this by now, um, I'm happy to announce that uh, both uh, the Kickstarters, uh, Lori and Corey's uh, Hero U Rogue Redemption uh, Kickstarter and Dave Marsh's Shadowgate Kickstarter have uh, both met their funding goals, so we should be seeing those games very soon. Uh, thank you very much, everyone who pledged to those and supported these teams. I am really looking forward to playing their games. Also, as always, if you want to support this show and keep these interviews and episodes coming, uh, please go to armchairarcade.com. Uh, you can set up a one-time subscription, a <laughs> one-time payment, rather, or a uh, monthly subscription. Uh, you pay whatever you think these episodes are worth to you, uh, but it's very important, guys, keep these shows going, and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, by the way, if you uh, haven't done your Christmas shopping already, uh, there's some books available at armchairarcade.com. If you uh, buy them through those links, uh, the site will get a small uh, kickback for that. And uh, you can also support the show by buying your uh, good old games uh, from me uh, or through my affiliate program. Let's do that. Just again, go to Armchair Arcade, uh, look for the Match Hat link, and you can uh, see the GOG affiliate stuff there. Uh, it doesn't cost anything extra for that, uh, but a small percentage will gravitate my way. And speaking of uh, things gravitating my way, I have a really awesome ale for this week. I thought in honor of, uh, of the uh, Hero U Rogue Redemption Kickstarter. I tried to find a good rogue ale, and I found this one. Uh, this is the Ch Chateau Chateau Rogue. <laughs> uh, Grow the Revolution. This is a pumpkin patch ale. And apparently uh, the Rogue Brewery actually has their own pumpkin farm. I don't know if they're just joking with that. It sounds serious, but apparently they have a pumpkin patch where they grow their own pumpkins to, to use in this. So should be really good. Really uh, looking forward to this, so um, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this pumpkin patch ale here in the old uh, rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this, and you know, I don't really smell the pumpkins. It kind of surprises me. So a lot of the other pumpkin ales uh, I've tried had a really strong uh, pumpkin aroma to it, but this, you know, just smells like a regular stout, maybe a Guinness. Uh, let's give it a, a taste, though. Now that is a really, yeah, there's, there's the pumpkin. Uh, so you definitely get uh, the pumpkin in the flavor, which I guess is where it's really important. A uh, very, very pleasant uh, taste here. It's kind of pumpkin pie spice. Uh, there's no overpowering uh, alcohol flavor or anything like that. Uh, this is actually quite smooth, uh, quite drinkable. I dare say that even somebody that didn't really care for beer, you know, those people are out there. Even somebody like that would probably like this. I mean, this is quite nice. Just really good. I don't see how you can, anybody could criticize this. Uh, really, really a solid choice, especially if you like a pumpkin, which I hope that you do, because <laughs> it's great stuff. I'm gonna go a full five out of five horns on this one. Really good choice, especially if you like pumpkins. Now let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. And the quotation for this week comes from Isaac Asimov. And it goes something like this. I do not fear computers. I fear the lack of them. See you guys next week.
If you're supposed to be the superior race of the universe, why don't you try climbing after us? Bye-bye!